In today's video, we take a look at the disappearance of Anne Locke. The first part of the video will be the crime watch reconstruction, and the second part will be the police investigation afterwards. Now to the first of this month's reconstructions. Anne Locke, a secretary at London Weekend Television, had been married just a month when she vanished on her way home one Sunday night. It's a case that's produced big headlines and wild rumours. Tonight, we'll be showing the face of a man that police need to trace in connection with her disappearance. Our reconstruction starts seven weeks ago at Anne's home in Hertfordshire. Just after lunch on Sunday afternoon, May the 18th, Anne Locke's boss phoned from London Weekend Television. I've been about, uh, about four o'clock. Anne occasionally worked Sundays, but the producer asked if she could work a little later than usual. No, I don't mind. Of course I don't mind. That's fine. All right then. See you later. Bye. Anne's 86-year-old grandmother lives in the same house and she remembers all was normal when Anne left home. Bye, Nan. I won't be late. Anne's husband was in Dorset for the weekend, planning a diving trip for their sub-aqua club. He was away till late that night. This particular Sunday, we had just sold her car and she would normally on a Sunday have driven all the way up to LWT where she could have parked her car. But on this particular occasion, because she had no car and the new one had not yet arrived, she cycled to Brookmans Park Station. Brookmans Park is a prosperous Hertfordshire village just north of Potter's Bar. Anne was known around the village by her maiden name, Sunyuk. That Sunday, Anne was only just back from her honeymoon and she had a noticeable suntan for mid-May. Excuse me, what time's the next train, please? To 43. 43? Yep. Yeah. The ticket collector clearly remembers Anne arriving with her bike. Almost certainly, she would have parked it in the station bike sheds and locked it. Anne's normal route to work took her on the Welling Garden City to London Line that used to be called the GN Electric. It stops at places like Potter's Bar and Finsbury Park. London Weekend Television on the South Bank. Anne finished typing the London programme scripts at around 8.30. On her way out, she had to hand copies of the scripts to drivers who delivered them to the producers' homes. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Oh, you come to collect these? Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. That's yours there. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Driver, if no one is in, please put through letterbox. You must be joking. What do you think we're going to do? Drink it back? Well, you might do. Some drivers would. I'll see you. Thanks. No, no. These were the last people known to have spoken to Anne. No one seems to have seen her since. Assuming Anne went home, she'd normally have walked to Waterloo Underground, the York Road entrance. There she would have waited on the Bakerloo Line platform and taken a northbound train. There are no sightings so far of Anne on this section of her journey, nor at Oxford Circus, where normally she changed onto the Victoria Line. At Finsbury Park, Anne would have switched to British Rail, probably the 938 to Welling Garden City, which would take her to Brookmans Park. No one has come forward who saw Anne that Sunday evening. But if you were there, something might jog your memory. 
a fellow passenger was behaving rather oddly. It's 9.38 on Sunday, May the 18th. Nine stops down from Finsbury Park is Brookman's Park, Anne's home. The bike shed is unlocked and the station is unmanned. This teenager has come forward and remembers seeing someone about half an hour before that London train arrived. Have you seen anybody with an air gun? No, why? Somebody been shooting at pedestrians with an air gun. No, I haven't. The offence has to them off it. By this time, Anne's husband, Lawrence, had got back from his boat trip. I arrived home just before 10 o'clock. Um, Nan met me on the drive and she was quite distressed as Anne hadn't come home and she hadn't phoned either. I unhitched a boat, unloaded the car and drove back down to Brookman's Park Station. I got there, had a look in the bike shed to see if her bike was there and it wasn't. It had, it had already gone. Um, I was about to leave when I saw a train coming in. Just after 10, the train Anne should have been on arrived at Brookman's Park. This couple, Mr and Mrs Masterman, home from a hiking trip, are sure that they were the only people to get off at Brookman's Park. I phoned work to actually ascertain that she had left, and they said that she had and left quite some time earlier. I phoned a couple of friends to see if she was around there. I checked the, with the police to see if she had been involved in a road accident on her bike. I then reported her missing to the police at Hatfield. At dawn, five o'clock on Monday morning, police found Anne's bike 60 yards from the station shed. It was still padlocked. From here, Hertfordshire police have mounted a seven-week search of fields, woods and parkland near the Brookmans Park railway station. It's so far taken over 16,000 man-hours. It's turned up some slight evidence that Anne Locke might have got as far as Brookman's Park that Sunday night. Her diary and address book were found along the footpath that crosses Bluebridge Road. Inspector Paul Dockley, you personally found that address book, but it was 700 yards away from the diary found by one of your colleagues. That is quite correct. Now, how do you account for that? Well, in fact, one of the considerations we're making is that that bag that Anne was carrying, which is a black zip-up bag, which we have here, this is a replica, yeah? This is a replica. Could have been found and the items abandoned from that bag by some passerby after the event. Um, now, obviously, we have made inquiries with the Director of Public Prose Prosecutions with regard to this, and he's agreed that there will be no police prosecution. If any person comes forward saying they found that bag, removed any of the contents or the money that was in it, uh, as long as they're not um, involved with the disappearance of Anne Locke. And of course it could have been somebody quite innocently, finding the address book, whatever, tossing it away, thinking it was of no good to that's, anybody. That's you desperately possible. need anybody who found the bag or the contents, anything like that in that area. Now, that teenager who saw that man acting strangely uh, on the Sunday night at Brookman's Park, that was a, a fairly strange piece of behaviour. Well, not only was there that, but on the previous day, the Saturday, at uh, quarter to twelve in the evening, some people had been to a dinner party in Brookman's Park and returning to the station and there was a bench across the entrance to the platform which made them uh, walk in a rather obscure angle onto the platform. They were approached by a man. He asked what time the last train was, stood around for a few minutes and then he made his way out of the platform and up the stairs and out of view and he hasn't been seen since. So on two consecutive nights, just before she disappeared, around the time she disappeared, there was somebody acting strangely. You've got a description. We've got a, the first video fit of this man. Can you describe him to us? Yes, this man is described as 35 to 40 years. He's 5 foot 6 inches tall, of medium build. He has a receding hairline and collar length brownish hair, dark brown hair. Uh, he was wearing a bomber jacket and dark coloured jeans or trousers. And it is uh, believed that he just spoke with a local accent. Right, now that's an entirely new description. And of course, the man presumably need not have been a local. I mean, Brookman's Park is right on the A1 and the M25. That is correct. So yes. he, he could, frankly, have come from anywhere. He could have done. She's been missing a long time now. I mean, do you think there's any chance that Anne is still alive? We are obviously very concerned for her safety. And we do fear that she may have come by her death. Right. Okay, well, uh, if you feel that uh, you can help in any way, please 
Do call us. Detectives are waiting for you. Call right now. Anne Locke, who was 29 years old, was entering an exciting time in her life, having just married and returned from her honeymoon in the Seychelles. She worked as a secretary at London Weekend Television and was called to work on May the 18th, 1986, leaving her bicycle at Brooklands Park Station before catching a train to the capital. She left work at 8.30pm, called her grandmother to say she was coming home and then caught a commuter train from London's King Cross at 9.45pm. Anne was supposed to arrive at Brooklands Park around 11pm, but when she failed to return home, her husband Lawrence rushed to the station, where she was nowhere to be seen. Earlier in the day, her bike had been hidden by the murderers, and when she arrived, she was grabbed and led down the railway tracks to a nearby field. She was strangled to death, and an attempt was made to set her body on fire, much like the second victim, Marty Tamboza. Miscommunication between Hertfordshire and Met Police meant her body wasn't found for nine weeks. By that time it was badly decomposed and any evidence as who had killed Anne had been destroyed. By this time police had already started to close in on a suspect, former railway carpenter John Duffy. He had already been charged with the assault of his estranged wife and had knowledge of the railway. But evidence truly began to mount against him when a rare type of string called some yarn was found in his parents' house, a string which had been used in the tourniquet found at the scene of the first two murders. On November the 26th, 1986, Duffy was arrested after following a woman in a secluded park. He was found with evidence linking him to the murder of Marty Tamboza and other assault victims. He was then charged with the murders of 15-year-old Alison Day and Anne Locke and stood trial in February 1988 where he was convicted of two murders and four assaults and sentenced to 30 years in prison, which was later extended to life. Duffy was, however, acquitted of killing Anne Locke. The mix-up of the nine-week search of her body meant forensics could not be used to link him to the murder. Due to a major error in planning the search, there was a breakdown in communications between Hertfordshire Police and the Metropolitan Police. Both thought each was going to cover this 200 metre section of the embankment and it didn't get searched. Although Duffy was safely behind bars, the case was far from over and in 1998 he began to talk. During police interviews he admitted to murdering Anne Locke, but he could not be retried due to double jeopardy law which prevents an accused person from being tried again on the same or similar charges following an acquittal. Duffy admitted that David Mulcavia had committed the murders too and the police had finally had the second person they long suspected had been involved. Mulcahy had been convicted of three counts of murder, seven counts of assault and was given three life sentences, providing some closure for Anne's friends and her family after Duffy's acquittal. <laughs> 